Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Best Practices, Five Steps to Live Cell Imaging. I am Michelle Ashton of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and brought to you by Thermal Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.thermofisher.com slash five steps dash live. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. All questions will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration after the presentation is over. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credit tab located at the top of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Augie Golub, PhD, R&D Scientist of Protein and Cell Analysis at Thermo Fisher Scientific. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Augie, you may now begin your presentation. Okay, uh, well, it seems that it's about time that we got started with today's webinar. Um, I'd like to first thank all of you for joining us today and attending this um, webinar on live cell imaging. My name is Augie Golub. I'm an R&D scientist uh, with Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm located in the Eugene, Oregon facility, which was formerly the Molecular Probes campus, where we work on developing uh, many of the commonly used dyes uh, and uh, fluorescent conjugates that are used in fluorescence microscopy. And today's webinar will be solely focused on live cell imaging using fluorescence. And that um, uh, a specific breakdown of the topic will be presented in a manner where we'll cover what we refer to as the five steps to live cell imaging. So the five steps to live cell imaging uh, will essentially serve as kind of an outline for the remainder of this talk. Um, and the steps are outlined um, here in this, in this slide where essentially the first two steps are um, largely aimed at essentially determining um, whether live cell imaging is really necessary for the type of experimental question that one is trying to investigate. And then, of course, culturing those cells in preparation for um, a live cell imaging experiment. And so with those two steps being um, uh, something that's pretty commonly performed in, uh, in most labs, we'll go ahead and focus most of the content in today's uh, webinar on the, on the last three steps, which is really where our expertise from the product development comes in with um, determining the optimal types of labels for um, live cell experiments, as well as how to optimize um, uh, your labeling and imaging conditions so that you can get quality uh, data. And then last but not least, we will also touch base on how to um, go about actually performing live cell imaging without um, any detrimental effects. Because as, any, as many of you are probably familiar with, um, when it comes to live cell imaging, it can be quite a bit more challenging than uh, imaging fixed dead cells. So what are some of the main advantages of live cell imaging over fixed cell imaging? So if we, if we start at the very first step of kind of the, the planning phase where we're trying to build a foundation for our entire experiment, we should really sit down at first and, and determine uh, what advantages we stand to gain from uh, doing, moving into live cell imaging versus kind of the traditional uh, fixed type of uh, uh, analysis. So of course, one of the main advantages uh, can be illustrated with these panels here on the right, where if we look at the traditional fixed cell specimen on the bottom right, we might be able to investigate um, some type of biological uh, uh, 
event happening over time by taking uh, uh, snapshots at different time points. Whereas if we perform live cell imaging, we can actually observe these processing as they happen um, in real time. And so this allows us to um, track interactions between cells and within cells and their compartments. And so if this, of course, get, grants us a whole new dimension for analysis um, and much better physiological relevance. Um, now, some of the considerations to keep in mind, of course, is that the labeling approaches for live cells is, um, uh, can be quite drastically different than the approaches that one would take for fixed cell preparations. And then from an imaging standpoint, as I mentioned even in the previous slide, it can be quite a bit more challenging to actually capture this data um, because the cells are moving and uh, you're subjecting them to light over continuous time, time periods and they need to be in a proper environment and incubator. So there's quite a few things to uh, think about here. And we'll talk about these in subsequent slides. So if we go back to these um, five steps, we can move into um, step number two, where uh, we really um, are, are now committed to a live cell imaging experiment. And so we need to start off with a nice, healthy cell culture, because um, as with really any biological experiment, a, a successful experiment starts with a nice, healthy cell culture. So we need to learn how to properly grow and maintain our cells in their optimal growth conditions. I won't spend too much time on this topic because, uh, again, I think that this is something that's very commonly um, found in, 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 in most labs. Um, you know, we have pretty standard practices for culturing and growing the cell types that we're commonly working with. Um, some of the more common considerations to think about when culturing your cells are, of course, the, the plates and the dishes that are being used, um, any particular additives or uh, media supplements that might be required for your specific cell type. And then, um, of course, you need to have the proper environmental control um, for these cells to grow in, um, in an incubator. But before you can even really start to perform any types of experiments and assays and even for routine passaging of cells, um, it is quite essential during the culturing phase um, to have a proper cell count of your cultures as you're progressing from uh, one passage to the next and as you're even sub-passaging from just maintaining your cells for an experiment. Um, and, and, and again, for a successful experiment, it really does need to begin with an accurate um, cell count. And so cell counting is relatively straightforward um, uh, to perform, or at least it seems that way um, uh, on, the, on the face of it, until you start to really kind of get into these higher density cultures and being able to track uh, viability along with total cell count where instruments um, and benchtop uh, cell counters such as the Countess 2 FL um, are really very, um, uh, very powerful companion devices that really enable you to not only get more accurate results, but more reproducible uh, results from uh, one time to, uh, to the next. So um, this is a type of instrument that of course allows you to not only generate a total cell count, but also viability cell count in order to assess how many of the cells that you have in your population are actually um, viable and usable for downstream applications. Going back to our outline of uh, steps, we will now move into really kind of the meat of the rest of this talk, which as I mentioned in the introduction, will really be focused on the steps three, four, and five, which are you know the labeling, optimizing, and imaging in live cell cultures. So if we start with um, kind of a high level overview of the different labeling methods that are available to us, generally speaking, they fall into these three pretty distinct um, categories where we have uh, perhaps the most commonly used approach here on the left, which is using antibodies. Um, typically, this is, of course, done with a primary antibody that recognizes your antigen of interest inside um, or uh, on, the, on the outside of the cell. And then that primary antibody is followed up with a secondary antibody that's conjugated to uh, fluorophores most uh, traditionally. And then those fluorophores are what we are able to um, detect. Unfortunately, this approach is generally not compatible with live cell imaging since antibodies tend to be rather large and bulky and not cell permeable. Um, in the rare instance that you have a cell surface marker, you may be able to visualize it using an antibody, but most 
intracellular um, uh, labels are not compatible with antibody labeling. So this is where we now start to rely on different types of approaches. Um, one of them, of course, is a genetically um, encoded approach. So these are uh, the traditional fluorescent protein types of labels, so GFP, RFP, and um, really all the rest of the fluorescent protein family. And these are, of course, um, uh, require live cells in order to be expressed and folded up properly and become fluorescent. So this is very much a live cell compatible workflow. And then uh, really the bread and butter of the campus that um, I work at, the former molecular probes campus, are of course small molecule fluorescent conjugates where we rely on organic dyes um, in order to either deliver the dyes themselves directly to a compartment or conjugate the dyes to um, another molecule in order to give it specificity. And um, not all of these are live cell compatible, but many are. So we'll um, talk about some different examples of, um, of live cell compatible fluorescent molecules in the next set of slides. But first we'll cover various approaches towards genetically encoded labeling methods. And one of these methods um, that we have developed over the years um, is called BACMAM. And BACMAM essentially stands for Insect Baculovirus with Mammalian Promoter. And as that name um, implies, what, what that tells us is that this is a technology that takes advantage of an insect virus, a baculovirus. And what we've done is we've substituted the insect promoter with the mammalian uh, CMV promoter in order to facilitate the expression in mammalian cells. So um, uh, on the right is a table that highlights some of the commonly available uh, BACMAM uh, reagents that are ready to be used. And that this is really one of the key advantages to this approach is that because this is a prepackaged virus, um, it is not only easy to use, but it is ready to be um, expressed in cells without really any molecular cr cloning needed by uh, the end user. And as you can see on the table on the right, there's a pretty broad selection of both GFP and RFP fused um, targeting uh, uh, domains that either enable you to visualize different organelles and compartments within a cell as well as different cytoskeletal structures. So one of the uh, key considerations for using BACMAM technology um, is, uh, is essentially getting the most optimal transduction efficiency. So the reagent is relatively easy to use where essentially it comes uh, prepackaged as a concentrated uh, viral titer that you essentially um, dilute onto your cells and incubate over um, overnight. And so then when you show up the following morning, you have cells that are expressing your fluorescent proteins that are now ready for live cell imaging. Um, generally speaking, the highest transduction efficiency happens uh, while the cells are still in, um, in their log phase uh, growth. And so you, t you want to transduce before they're fully confluent, generally speaking at a confluency of about 70% or less. And then different cell types respond to the virus um, in different levels, and they may require a different multiplicity of infection uh, from one cell type to the next. So this is uh, one of the key parameters that really needs to be determined for your specific cell type, um, regardless of the virus that's being used. You need to determine what's called the MOI, or the multiplicity of infection, and that's done uh, relatively easily. You essentially need to um, uh, uh, establish a titration of the viral particle on your cell. And generally speaking, this range is somewhere between about five and a hundred um, viral particles per, uh, per cell. And so using a very simple equation that's highlighted there on the bottom, you can determine the um, volume of reagent that you need for your labeling. Now, besides genetically encoded approaches, as I mentioned, uh, another commonly um, taken approach is using small molecule organic dyes. Um, and so this is what I would like to actually spend the uh, vast majority of the rest of this talk um, uh, uh, focused on is different types of fluorescent uh, labels and molecules and different approaches that we can take towards um, optimizing their, uh, their use. So here we have an example of a live cell, um, a U2OS cell specifically, that's labeled with three different tracker dyes. 
So many of our uh, trackers are uh, indeed intended for live cell imaging. And so here, what we have is an example of a cell that's labeled with three different live cell compatible trackers. We have a tubulin tracker, uh, deep red, a mito tracker green, and a lyso tracker blue. So what we now uh, see is that we're of course able to not only label these um, specific structures, but we're able to multiplex uh, using multiple uh, multiple dyes in order to visualize different structures at at once. And one of the really key advantages to this approach over genetically encoded approaches is, is, your, is the speed with which you are able to achieve um, labeling. This is generally um, accomplished within um, anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour, um, depending on the, on the reagent and its mechanism of uh, loading. And another really great advantage that can often be overlooked is that because the, the, the small molecules are incubated, on top of the cells in the media, what you end up with is a very uniform staining across your entire population. Um, that can be one of the significant drawbacks to genetic approaches is that you will have cells that have taken up uh, uh, multiple uh, or variable levels of virus and are therefore variably expressing compared to one another. So you can have uh, quite drastic levels of labeling and expression Whereas with these small molecule fluorescent labels, the labeling tends to be very uniform because all cells are incubated with the same concentration and for the same amount of time. Some of the considerations to think about, just like um, with everything else, there's of course drawbacks to um, this approach as well. And one of the key drawbacks is that you can get non-specificity um, uh, that, that can result from excessive labeling, is essentially from using too high of a concentration. Um, high concentrations will also potentially affect the physiology of your cells and potentially induce prolonged cell cycle and maybe even cytotoxicity at um, uh, very high concentrations. But when you get those concentrations and conditions right, they of course enable you to perform live cell imaging that can be tracked over, uh, uh, over time, um, e either on the scale of hours or even um, days. So I'd like to start with um, really just a very uh, high level consideration of using small molecule fluorescent labels and that's concentration. Um, this is something that we spend a lot of time optimizing during the development of these, um, of these types of conjugates. And so this is an example of that tubulin tracker deep red that I showed in the previous slide. Um, and this is something that I worked on uh, personally over the past couple of years. So during the development of um, this particular label, what we found is that if we tried to perform these long time lapse um, experiments with cells incubated with about one micromolar of uh, the reagent, what we see is that after about a couple days and at the end of um, 48 hours in this, uh, in this case, we see that the cell cycle essentially completely s slows down and at the end of this time lapse these cells um, die completely. Whereas if we cut that concentration down um, tenfold to um, about 0.1 micromolar, we can now see that at this 48 hour time point, the cells are not only completely alive, um, but they're able to go all the way out to 72 hours. And during this entire time lapse, they're able to divide, proliferate, the microtubules are still exhibiting their normal dynamic behavior, um, and everything is uh, physiologically unperturbed in this event. And the only difference essentially between these two um, experimental conditions is the concentration that's used. So it's a very important consideration when using these types of labels for long-term time-lapse imaging um, is to make sure that you, you do not um, excessively label because the dye itself can, of course, inter interfere and perturbed with um, uh, the natural physiological mechanisms of your, of your cell type. So that's really just one of the key parameters that needs to be optimized. And again, oftentimes this is something that we will spend a lot of time um, performing the optimization on, on, the, on the front end. But of course, we're not really able to do this with every single cell type um, out there. So it is something that um, sometimes needs to be performed um, um, on a cell type specific basis, but we'll at least provide general guidelines on concentrations and fold dilutions on where to start. Um, so we'll move into step number four um, then and, and really talk about some of the other parameters that, that can be thought about um, for optimization during live cell imaging.
One of the really key parameters to think about when investigating live cells is, is of course, this, this question and idea of are we perturbing the system and are we, are we causing some type of toxicity um, to our cell line just by the sheer nature of labeling them with a fluorescent molecule. Um, so because these experiments can be quite time consuming to, to generate and um, to really uh, fine tune, it's quite important um, to really investigate this, the state of the cell health um, upon either you know, your, your labeling or some type of treatment that you're doing. And this can be done using various indicators that we refer to as cell health indicators. And so these are typically reagents that um, span the cell health continuum as we refer to it as, um, where we have completely healthy cells and the, the, the reporter will enable you to get uh, an assessment of uh, how healthy uh, or if those cells are indeed healthy, all the way out to a completely dead population and everything in between. So what we have here on the right is an example of a couple different um, reagents that can actually be multiplexed to give you uh, a, a combined picture of um, of cell health and, and in particular mitochondrial health by looking at the mitochondrial health using a small molecule label called TMRM which loads based on uh, mitochondrial membrane potential and this is being multiplexed with a uh, reactive oxygen species detector called cell rocks green um, so what we have here is an example of U2S cells that have been treated with a drug called menadione, which displaces cytochrome C from, uh, uh, from the electron transport chain. And so what this now uh, results in is a drastic increase in reactive oxygen species. And so if we start this time lapse, we'll see that these red healthy mitochondria start to depolarize and therefore the TMRM signal leaks out. And we now see that as the cytochrome C is being displaced, then we get this uptick in um, uh, reactive oxygens from uh, the metadione taking effect. We see that the positive signal from the cell rocks, the reactive oxygen species um, sensor starts to come on. So this is uh, a really uh, elegant and effective way to investigate the health of your um, population by using a combined approach, one that uh, gives you a readout for healthy cells and one that gives you a readout of um, toxic cells. Now these types of experiments, as I mentioned, can be rather time consuming to not only set up but also acquire and it can um, involve quite a bit of um, setup and optimization and, and troubleshooting. So a really easy and elegant approach towards speeding some of, the, uh, some of this work up on the front end is to use a, a, a slightly simpler approach where we're not necessarily doing time-lapse imaging um, and setting up these continuous multi-hour um, overnight potentially time lapses and trying over and over again is we can we can actually use the countess once again uh, but instead of just simply counting the cells like we did at the front end for culturing and passaging the countess FL or the countess 2 FL specifically um, is actually compatible with two fluorescent light cubes um, from our EVOS microscopes and so what this now allows you to do is investigate fluorescence um, or, or a positive fluorescent signal using a benchtop cell counter. So if we go back to that same example from the previous slide of investigating mitochondrial health using TMRM and cell rocks green, if we pull samples from these various time points and simply trypsinize the cells so that we can load them into the countess, we can now uh, assess whether the treatment is working and if the reagents are indeed giving us, giving us an, enough signal in the proper response by assessing the fluorescence in uh, the countess 2FL. And so on, on the bottom, we see a representative image of one of those um, uh, uh, data points where we see that we're at this transition between the Texas Red um, uh, TMRM signal going down and the GFP positive cell rocks green signal coming on. Um, so it's, it's really just a, another tool that one should consider uh, when really kind of starting to set up a new set of experiments. Um, this can be uh, rather powerful and quite, um, uh, 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 quite valuable in terms of time, uh, uh, time savings. So in this next set of slides, what I'd like to talk about a bit are different approaches that one can take to improve um, the loading and retention of these fluorescent labels that we've been talking about. Um, because oftentimes um, it can be a bit of a challenge to get some of these labels into living cells. And then once they're in there, they tend to want to disperse and um, essentially leak out uh, over time. And so there are a couple different 
um, uh, reagents and approaches that we can uh, that we can utilize in order to improve both of these uh, steps. So, well, the advantages here are, of course, that it it, it enables us to get um, higher signal with lower background over uh, over time. But of course, some considerations that we have to take are that these approaches may not be compatible in all cell types. And the fact that uh, we're, we're going to be adding additional components to these experiments also mean that potentially we may induce some cytotoxic effects. So we'll talk about that here a little bit in the following slides. Uh, the first approach I'd like to talk about is a, a method for improving the loading of uh, different fluorescent labels. And so this can be done with um, different uh, uh, compounds that uh, we typically refer to as, uh, as, as surfactants. And one of them is called Pluronic F127. Um, in the previous slide, you saw um, uh, uh, an illustration re referring to a product called PowerLoad. And PowerLoad is, is, is essentially a combination of these different pluronics that has been formulated for loading um, of AM esters. Here what we're using is a single pleuronic F127 that we have uh, found to be very effective for loading our green tubulin tracker. Um, so we'll be using this tubulin tracker example throughout uh, much of this, uh, this talk. And as I mentioned before, the new reagent that we worked on uh, recently is this deep red version of tubulin tracker. So what we, we can actually see here is that if we look at our original tubulin tracker, the green on the bottom, um, on the bottom left we have a fluorescent image that is matched in exposure and contrast to um, uh, the the image on on the on the right, and what we see is that if we just incubate with the tubulin tracker by itself, we don't get very effective loading um, at all. The signal is actually quite dim um, and is really barely above background, and that can be reflected in the um, uh, quantification there on the right. But if we co-incubate and load with Pleuronic F127, we see a drastic increase in the loading um, of, this particular, uh, of this particular label. Now, on the other hand, if we employ the same approach with our new tubulin tracker Deep Red, we'll see that uh, the molecule by itself is actually quite effective um, at loading without Pleuronic, and that by the addition of Pleuronic, we actually um, are uh, uh, causing a detrimental effect on the amount of signal that we have to work with. So this is what I was uh, referring to in the previous slide where um, these approaches aren't necessarily a universal solution and may indeed be detrimental, but in the cases where we found them to be uh, effective, they gre greatly and drastically improve uh, the loading of these fluorescent dyes. Now, of course, another issue that you often encounter when doing live cell imaging, especially over long periods of time, is that even though the label might get loaded and uh, is successfully um, internalized into the cells, is, uh, you often are required to perform what's called a washout step. So that means you have to exchange the media uh, that contains all the unbound and non-loaded fluorophore so that you can uh, decrease the background that you're working with. And so what this, of course, means is that as soon as you exchange the media, you now uh, uh, are going to have exchange of the molecule from inside the cell wanting to leak out and uh, uh, and go outside. So that's what we can essentially see here is that the retention of these labels will start to um, uh, suffer after a couple of hours. And so this is again uh, another example of tubulin tracker and this one and is just looking at tubulin tracker deep red. And if we use a, a efflux pump inhibitor called probenicid, um, what we see is that we can actually greatly improve the retention of these uh, small molecules over longer periods of time by enabling them to um, stay retained inside the cells by blocking those efflux pumps. So on the top, we have a representative image from the first time point of these cells being loaded, and then they're being incubated and imaged over time um, in complete media, but without any probenicid present. And what we see after um, about two hours is that the signal not only decreased, but the background greatly increased um, a, a, as in, a, a indicating that the probe is leaking out of the cells and into the media and contributing to the background, uh, background fluorescence. Now, if we perform the same type of labeling, but incubate these cells with probenicid present in complete media, what we see is that we can image over this um, time course of about two hours with really very minimal loss in signal and very minimal um, increase in background. And you can see this uh, being present on the right-hand quantification as well. Um, 
consideration with this as with many uh, things that we've talked about so far including you know the labels themselves you want to make sure that you're not using them at too high of a concentration the same holds true for probenicid you want to make sure that you're not using it at too high of a concentration or for too long otherwise you will induce um, cytotoxicity from uh, that, that blockage of the efflux pumps over extended incubation times Last but not least, um, once we've loaded the cells um, and have are, uh, incubated them with something like probenicid to prevent uh, the leaking out of the label, we're now, of course, ready to start imaging um, our cells on a live cell microscope. And so at this point, we're going to start uh, subjecting the cells to a fair amount of light in order to get some signal out of these fluorophores. And as well, uh, many of you are, I'm sure, familiar, um, light is not only damaging to the cells themselves, but is also damaging to the fluorophores that we're imaging. So uh, with many fixed cell um, protocols and imaging approaches, we will often use a mounting medium, which prevents photo bleaching. So we'll typically refer to these as antifades. And what we have developed in the past is an antifade that's compatible with live cells as well. Um, with the idea being that we're also trying to preserve not only the signal um, from fixed cell preparations, but also all the signals the signal that we get in live cell preparations. So here we have a couple of representative images um, of uh, cells that are being uh, 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 that are being imaged at 120 independent consecutive exposures with and without uh, the prolonged live um, antifade um, live cell imaging reagent. And on the top, we have the cells that are being protected with Prolong Live, and on the bottom, we have cells that are untreated. And you can see the drastic difference in the remaining signal with and uh, without the Prolong Live antifade. Um, another consideration to think about with this approach, though, is just because you're able to protect the signal from uh, photo bleaching, um, that, that, that does, doesn't mean that you should continue to put light into the system because even though you have signal remaining from your fluorophores, high illumination may still induce uh, phototoxicity. We'll move on uh, now into a different category. Instead of looking at how to label and retain and preserve signal, what we'd actually, what I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about is the other side of of, uh, of imaging, which is background, right? So everything that we do in imaging is really aimed at enhancing our signal while lowering the background in order to have the best contrast, uh, not only for you know visually appealing images, but for something that we can actually quantify and segment um, and get some type of valuable information out of. So we have various sources of background that we need to deal with. We of course have. Um, background from the instrument and the camera or whatever detector that we're using, which is something that we rarely have any control um, over. But we do have control over some of these other sources, such as uh, from the reagent itself. As I uh, briefly alluded to a couple slides ago, when we typically do these um, uh, small molecule um, labeling experiments, we will often need to remove and wash out uh, the label at the end of that uh, incubation to remove any non-specifically bound probe. And so uh, what this now, uh, of course, leads to is the leaking out of that probe out of the cells, but it does remove much of that um, extracellular background that will be found in the medium. Uh, the samples that we work with, of course, can also be autofluorescent, specifically in, in the shorter wavelengths, in the greens um, and, the, and the blues. And then the media that many of us uh, use for uh, uh, culturing cells will have autofluorescent components that are very useful um, indicators of um, pH, but are quite detrimental in terms of image quality. So this is probably one of the simplest uh, steps that we can take towards reducing background is actually in the, the culturing media um, by simply removing those autofluorescent uh, 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 components from the media, we can greatly improve the contrast by reducing the background from the media contribution. And this can be accomplished by using a specific formulation of DMEM uh, that's called Fluorobrite DMEM, which is essentially DMEM media but without uh, the phenol red in it for uh, indicating pH. So what we can see is a couple of representative images of um, regular DMEM uh, with all the uh, all the components, including the phenol red. And then on the bottom, we have a representative image of cells that are being imaged in this optically clear 
fluorobrite DMEM. And then on the right is um, a quantification of this um, uh, of signal to background in either PBS, which of course is uh, positive control here. That is also optically clear. That is um, essentially comparable to the fluorobrite DMEM signal to background, whereas DMEM with phenol red has relatively low signal to background compared to these uh, to these two approaches. So this is a pretty simple thing to do, and, uh, and they can really greatly improve um, the, the signal to background by eliminating background from the media contribution. Now another approach that one can take specifically in live cells is by use of a background suppressor. Um, so this is a, a, a achieved with a different reagent that's called backdrop um, background suppressor and the way that this works essentially is that it's a reagent that quenches um, any signal outside of living cells and so it's it's a dye um, that's a general quencher of fluorescence but it is not cell permeable so what that means is that when you incubate um, cells with a label such as tubulin tracker green or tubulin tracker deep red again going back to that same example of these two molecules that we've been talking about for loading and retention uh, what we see is that if we don't perform a washout step and we perform and, and we take an image um, with tubulin tracker green in particular we see that every single uh, pixel in this frame is fully saturated um, and then the same is essentially true for tubulin track deep red but to a slightly lesser extent now if we start to take a live movie of this acquisition and we flow in the backdrop uh, suppressor what we see is that as soon as the backdrop is applied um, and uh, uh, incubated with these cells it successfully quenches all signal outside of these cells and so again the idea here is that it's a general quencher of fluorescence which is not able to cross the cell membrane and so it quenches all the unbound dye that's in the media while leaving your intracellular signal intact. And so this works very well with many green um, and red uh, fluorescent conjugates. And then as you can see here to a certain extent, it's also quite effective with um, deep red fluorophores. Um, but again, this is specific to living cells only in the event that the cell membrane is in any way compromised, whether that be due to cell death or due to some type of fix or, or uh, permeability type of workflow, the quencher will get inside the cells and it will quench all signal equally inside and out. Um, so it is only for live cell imaging. So that was a pretty um, uh, a brief overview of some of the different labeling methods as well as some of the different optimization methods. And so then in the, uh, in the last bit of this talk, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about different um, approaches and consideration when it comes to actually imaging live cells on a microscope. So first and foremost, um, much like with step number two, where we needed to culture the cells in preparation for a live cell experiment when we're performing a live cell experiment, especially over longer periods of time, um, one of the key considerations to keep in mind is that we need to keep the cells in their natural healthy environment. So this means that we need to incubate them. Um, generally speaking, the, this is done at 37 uh, degrees Celsius with about 5% CO2, 20% O2, and then we try to keep the humidity as, as high as possible. And the idea behind uh, keeping the humidity high is that you prevent evaporation of your media over time um, as it sits on the microscope. The higher you can keep the humidity, the less evaporation you'll have and the longer you can image. So. Here we have an example of a 48 hour um, time lapse taking images every two frames on one of our EVOS M7000 microscopes. And so this EVOS M7000 is equipped with an on-stage incubator that you can see there to the left of the microscope. And so that essentially provides a small incubator on the stage of the microscope uh, that enables you to not only modulate the um, temperature that the cells are in, but also um, the environmental condition in terms of gas content and humidity. But if we keep things generally normal and constant, what we can now see is that we can monitor cells over time and we can see these cells move and divide and proliferate over the uh, uh, course of this uh, time lapse. Now, in order to generate that type of data, um, it is important to, of course, keep your image in focus. And that can actually be uh, pretty challenging when it comes to imaging live cells because live cells are still alive and therefore they're moving. Um, and they're not only moving and uh, moving laterally or in X and Y, 
but there's also slight shifts in their Z position based on uh, small adjustments and small shifts in the, in the temperature, um, as well as just the potentially even the stage of your microscope, depending on the type of instrument that you're using. And so this is where we, of course, need to use some type of autofocusing routine in order to keep your image in focus. And most commonly, this is performed by using the fluorescent signal itself, as we'll run an algorithm that will take a small Z stack uh, through, uh, uh, through a volume, and then that Z stack will interpret where the signal is, um, is, is essentially the highest in order to keep that uh, signal in focus. But what this results in is a whole lot of extra light going into, into the system and, go in, and exposing to your cells. And so this can actually result in a fair amount of phototoxicity. And this isn't really something that's only a problem for autofocusing. It's a general consideration for live cell imaging um, to keep in mind how much light and how frequently you're sampling. Because if your sampling frequency is too high or using um, too much light, you'll essentially end up with a lot of cell death. And so what we can see as an example of that here on the left is if we perform autofocus with high illumination settings, we'll see that at about the 20 hour um, time point, most of these cells um, stop to, you know, stop moving and indeed start to completely die by the end, whereas the same time lapse um, is, is being run on the right uh, with lower autofocus illumination conditions. And we can see that these cells are much happier. They're able to continue proliferating and growing much like what we saw in, uh, in that first, uh, uh, first example on the previous slide. So uh, some considerations in general to keep in mind to prevent phototoxicity is to use the longest wavelengths um, of dyes that you have available. The longer the wavelength, the lower the energy of the light that's going into exciting them, and therefore the lower the uh, phototoxicity will be. And if uh, your instrument is equipped with a laser, a uh, near-infrared laser, autofocusing, um, uh, uh, autofocusing laser, then I would highly recommend that you utilize that in place of fluorescence-based um, autofocus. And then from a setting standpoint, use a, a, a relatively low illumination uh, power with higher exposures and gain compared to what you would typically do with fixed cell imaging. This may result in a slightly um, a grainier image, but it will allow your cells to survive these longer time courses. Um, and then generally speaking, your sampling frequencies shouldn't be too aggressive. Um, the more frequently you image, the more light you're putting uh, on your cells and then the more stress they'll be from that light. So as a general rule of thumb, uh, I, we tend to start with sampling frequencies of about 20 to 30 minutes, um, especially if using fluorophores that are excited in the violet um, and or green channels. Um, last but not least, I would also like to touch base on different types of microscopes. So what I what I showed in the last couple of slides was an example off one of our uh, wide field EVOS systems. Um, but many uh, users, of course, have the need for um, confocal microscopes as well. And one of the main advantages of a confocal microscope is, of course, um, the, their ability to take optical sections in uh, 3D specimens, but they also provide not only high resolution images due to um, generally uh, high quality optics, but also very high signal to background by minimizing much of that uh, background by simply eliminating that light from ever reaching the detector. So um, we talked about a couple different examples of suppressing background um, using wide field microscopes, such as using the background suppressor and taking out the phenol red out of the media. Um, the confocal microscope itself will actually greatly aid in the suppression of background as well by simply imaging only a very thin, uh, uh, a thin volume within the Z dimension, um, which will essentially reject much of that um, uh, uh, autofluorescent or background fluorescent light from the media. So many times an experiment that requires a wash and with a wide field system can be performed in a no wash type of um, workflow using a confocal system. So this is going to be an example of, that, uh, of using that tubulin tracker deep red once again. But in this case, we're actually taking images um, without performing a wash step using a confocal. So you can see right off the bat, the image quality is actually quite uh, quite superior in terms of signal to background where even though we're leaving the label on the cells the entire time um, we don't have that uh, that drastic auto 
uh, or sorry, background fluorescence uh, outside the cells from unloaded dye. Um, and we're not using any, any uh, suppressor or anything of the sort here either. Now, one of the other advantages to using these types of scopes is their general sensitivity tends to be much higher. So this also means that you can sample at much higher um, intervals and frequencies. So now instead of taking 20 uh, images every 20 minutes, we're actually able to take an image every five minutes. Um, and these are uh, primary hippocampal neurons, uh, which are relatively sensitive uh, cell type compared to the HeLa's that we were imaging previously. And we can see that we're able to image these every five minutes all the way out to about 72 hours without really any induction of um, cell health or, or cell toxicity or detachment from uh, the substrate. And this is, again, um, also duly in part uh, due to the fact that the tubular tracker Deep Red is excited by a Deep Red uh, 638 nanometer laser. So this longer wavelength um, combined with the higher sensitivity of the detector enables us to not only uh, sample over longer periods of time while keeping the uh, label on board the entire time for free exchange inside and outside the cells, but it also enables us to uh, uh, have much, much higher sampling frequency without causing any cytotoxicity. Um, some considerations to think about before moving from a wide field to a confocal is that it may not always be um, necessary. Oftentimes, um, the confocal instruments in shared facilities will have uh, a cost associated with them, and that cost may not uh, you know, be necessary for the experiment that you're, uh, uh, that you're uh, trying to perform. And then even though we have um, higher sensitivity detectors on many confocal systems, we also tend to have much higher intensity laser um, illumination. And so this can lead to a greater risk of phototoxicity due to higher intensity laser illumination. So this is where it's generally good practice to use the highest um, PMT um, uh, gain or, or camera gain, depending on the type of tech detector that you have, uh, using the highest gain setting that doesn't degrade image quality while losing the lowest amount of, of laser power possible in order to minimize any cytotoxic effects. So in summary, these are the five steps that we have talked about today and are kind of the general five steps that one can take when it comes to performing live cell imaging. The first step, as we talked about, of course, is to determine if live cell imaging is necessary for your experimental studies. Um, it can be quite a bit more challenging and time consuming to perform a live cell experiment versus a fixed type approach. And so it is important to really spend some time thinking about if it's, if it's necessary and then also planning out how to um, execute that experiment. Uh, the second step is to culture cells and start with a, with a nice, healthy um, culture that is not overconfluent and that is um, growing in optimized growth conditions, both in terms of environmental conditions and culturing media. And then really this is where kind of the rubber usually hits the road is, is, at, is at step three when it comes to labeling and optimizing and, and imaging. This is where it's really important to start um, paying attention to things like concentration um, and spectral overlap and really kind of spending some time, again, planning your labeling strategy and choosing the reagents that not only minimize spectral spillover effects, but also cytotoxic effects. Um, and so that's where um, it's, it's important to, to really spend some time in step number four to optimize uh, these conditions and methods in your particular um, experimental condition because uh, the, the, these, uh, these things will vary from one cell type to the next. Um, and so these first four steps can be pretty time consuming all on their own. And then the last step is um, you know, generally one that can be overlooked from time to time, which is the imaging, but it can actually be also relatively uh, challenging to perform the imaging itself because there are multiple parameters to think of when it comes to um, using fluorescence in live cells. And one of them, as we've talked about pretty extensively in the previous slides, is uh, not only the effect of cytotoxicity from your label, um, but phototoxicity from the act of imaging the cells uh, too frequently and with too much uh, illumination. So that concludes this particular five steps um, webinar. For more information about our webinars and similar types of uh, types of content, please feel free to um, visit our website for uh, various uh, various five steps tutorials and more information.
And with that, I would like to thank all of you once again for not only your um, attendance today, uh, but also for any questions that may uh, arise. And so uh, with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Avi, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today. Questions submitted today and during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Labberts will alert you via email when this webinar is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.